Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for another privilege, another chance, another opportunity, Father. We thank you again, Father God, for sparing our lives, for blessing us, Father God, to be able to shout, to praise you, to honor you, to glorify you. Lord, we magnify your name tonight. We thank you for another chance. We bless you, Father God. We ask you to speak to us tonight. Bless our lives, Father God, that our lives will be what you would have it to be. Lord, we ask you to forgive us for our sins. Bless our lives, Father God, that we will hear your word on tonight and be made the difference. It's in Jesus' name we pray and we ask it all. Amen and thank God. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. When you think of the goodness of God, it ought to make you want to shout. It ought to make you want to give him the honor, the glory, and all the praise. Hallelujah to the name. Such a pretty song, song by such a pretty girl. Thank you, Lord, for another chance, another opportunity to hear from you tonight. Yes, as Peter would say, the Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place, and I hope he's in the place where you are also. Let me call your attention to Philemon, Philemon of Philemon. Call your attention to Philemon again tonight. Philemon does not have chapters, therefore we're looking at verses. Philemon uh, verses 17 through 20 is where we will land tonight. Philemon verses 17 through 20 is where we will land tonight. Philemon, Philemon right before Hebrews, right after Titus, Philemon. Philemon, Philemon, verses 17 through 20 is where we are tonight. Hallelujah to the Lamb. God has blessed us again to study his word. It is an honor. It is, it is something that we ought to give God the glory in order to study his word. We have the privilege of studying the unadulterated word of God. Hallelujah. There is nothing greater than the bone structure of the word of God. Hallelujah. That this word is medicine to us in time of trouble. Amen. Amen. When we look at the book of Philemon, we notice that Paul is writing, the apostle Paul is writing a letter to his friend, his co-worker in the ministry, one who has been a blessing in Paul's life. Paul is writing a letter to Philemon. And we're going to find out tonight just what Paul says as he reminds Philemon of the blessing that Paul has been 
in Philemon's life. I said to you that Philemon has been a blessing in Paul's life. But tonight, Paul is going to point out some things to make sure that Philemon has not forgotten that Paul has been a blessing in his life. Let me tell you, when you have friends, when you have co-workers, when you have individuals who are walking together along the same path, everybody ought to bless everybody else's life. When you have couples, those couples, whether they are married or considering marriage, everybody ought to bring something to the table. Everybody ought to bless somebody's life. It ought to be a blessing for a man to be with a woman. It ought to be a blessing for a woman to be with a man. And now we find tonight Philemon and Paul being a blessing to each other. First of all, in brotherly love, and secondly, in the love of Jesus Christ. So Philemon receives this letter from Paul after Onesimus has run away as a slave. He, he is a runaway slave. Philemon is at home, Paul writes a letter to Philemon and the church that meets in Philemon's house. Paul addresses his wife. Paul addresses his son, reminding all of them that Onesimus has changed. Let me share with you tonight. Once you are changed, people ought to see a difference in you. Once you met Jesus, you ought to be different. Once you have changed, people all around you ought to see something about you that is different. Your speech ought to be different. Your walking with Christ ought to be stronger. How you greet other people ought to be different. How you treat people ought to be different. Let me just share with you, once you get to know Jesus Christ, you ought to be different. And once you get to know him, you ought to have a thirst, a hunger for the word of God. And you ought to have a thirst and a hunger to do those things which are right. Paul calls Philemon and he says to him, you ought to do this because it's the right thing to do. What is he asking them to do? Receive Onesimus. Your runaway slave received him back because he's different, because he's changed. He's my son in the ministry. He became my son in the ministry while we both were in chains. So let me just say to you today, because you are locked up or locked down, because you are, are separated from the general population, does not mean that you can't get to know Jesus Christ. Many brothers get to know him while they're locked up. Many brothers are actually really changed while they're locked up. Because once we are in chains, a change ought to happen in Jesus Christ. So he writes, he continues this letter. Tonight we, we're landing at verses 17 through 20. Paul is asking him to receive Onesimus for the sole purpose of him being useful to you now. He may not have been useful to you before. But I guarantee you, since Jesus Christ has come into his life, he is more useful now. Look at what he says. If then you count me as a partner, receive him as you would me. Paul says, I know we are partners in ministry. You know we are partners in ministry. We both understand the principles of Jesus Christ. And he says, if you truly receive me and you truly accept me as a partner, please receive him as you would me. Paul is saying to, to Philemon, uh, Onesimus is coming back home. I know he's a runaway slave, but I know that you would receive me differently than you would receive a runaway slave. So what I want you to do today is Receive him just as you would receive me. My, my, my. So I told you last week, he writes this letter of recommendation. In this letter of recommendation in antiquity during this period, these letter of recommendations meant much. They meant much. 
Paul writes this letter, and you will see he writes it with his own hand. It was not uncommon for an author to use a ghost writer or use a strive or use somebody else to write his notes and to tra tra transcribe his notes and to dictate his speech. But Paul is writing this letter on his own. He is writing it in his own hand. Look at verse number 17. It says, if then... You count me as a partner. If you count me as a fellow yokeman in the gospel, if you count me as somebody that you value, if you count me as a brother of Jesus Christ, then whatever you do, whatever you do, whatever conclusion you come to, receive him as you would receive me. Paul says, I know how you will receive me. You would receive me in open arms, even though I have killed Christians, even though I have fallen short, even though I have messed up. I know you will receive me well. Now, I'm asking you, even though Anisimus has messed up, receive him well also. Amen. He says, receive him as you would receive me. Let me tell you, somebody has done you wrong. You know they've done you wrong. They know they've done you wrong. Somebody has done you wrong, and you need to forgive them. <laughs> and because they've done you wrong, you cannot continue to hold them hostage. You have to forgive so you can move on. You have to forgive so your life will be made the better. You have people locked in prison. The problem with locking somebody in prison you got to stay there at the prison door and hold them in the prison. And if you even think about walking away, what you have to do is you have to make sure you hold on to the key. And so you preoccupied mentally with this key. You preoccupied with what folk have done to you. Your blood pressure is up because of what people have done. You want to kill somebody because of what people have done. You want to make sure you get back at them because of what people have done. As Paul says to Philemon, I say to you, let it go. Receive them back. Re receive them with open arms. Receive them as fellow brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. And to those who have done somebody wrong, take a note from Onesimus. Onesimus had gotten it right with the Lord, and he's willing to get it right with his fellow man. If you have done somebody wrong, you need to get it right with the Lord, and you need to get it right with your fellow man. <laughs> you need to get it right. You, you know, Sunday, we, we're, we're serving communion. Sunday, during the church service, we'll be partaking in communion. And we want to make sure that you are not holding a grudge or unforgiveness against anybody the moment before you take communion. So we have to live a lifestyle of forgiveness and not a lifestyle of unforgiveness. Paul says, receive Onesimus back unto you. He said only, I said to you last week, he said, receive him back because he's useful to you now. So he says, receive him back today, he says, receive him back just as you would receive me. Joyfully, excitedly, receive him back just like you would receive me. He says, he says in verse 18, but if he has wronged you and owes you anything, put that on my account. This this, this phrase, put this on my account. Paul is using a phrase that tells us when a person is indebted to another person. Put it on my tab. Put it on my account. He's saying, hold me responsible for it. Whenever you write a letter of recommendation, the person that you're writing a letter of recommendation to ought to be able to hold you responsible for what that individual does. So when you stand for somebody else, you are determined to make sure that that 
third person is forgiving person number two. And Paul says, if he's done any wrong, if he has done anything badly, put it on my account. Paul says, he says, but if he has wronged you or owe anything, put that on my account. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, we already know he's wrong. <laughs> he's wrong because he's a runaway slave. And in those days, when you became a runaway slave, you were living against the law. And because he had run away, we know he has wrong. But many theologians believe not only did he, did he run away, many theologians believe that he took some of the master's stuff when he left. He took some things when he left. Well, it comes to reason, it's common sense, that when you leave as a slave, you don't own anything. You have no possession. You don't own anything. And because you don't own anything, what you have to do as a slave is take some of the master's stuff in order to survive, in order to go from point A to point B. Because really, even the clothes you have on your back, you don't own them. So Paul says, if he took something, if he owes you anything, if he has, has taken some of your stuff, if he has misused anything, hold it to my account. He says, put that on my account. Paul is pleading Onesimus' case. Paul is willing to give up his pleasures so that Onesimus will be received well. Is there anybody you can stand for? Is there anybody that will stand for you? Is there anybody who will say, put it on my account? Well, mom and daddy has, has for years taken up children's slack. Mom and daddy, grown children, have been, been wrong, but their parents said, hey, I take care of it. Forgive my child. Mom and daddy has stood for children for years. Friends have stood for friends for years. Friends have stood on behalf of friends for years. Brothers have stood for brothers. Sisters have stood for sisters. And here in this chapter, in this verse, Paul is saying, I'm standing for my son in the ministry. I am standing for the brother in the ministry. I'm standing for Onesimus, and I'm willing to pay whatever he has done. I'm willing to pay for whatever he is guilty of. Put it on my account. You notice that Paul didn't even ask what he had done. Paul says, I will take the charge on his behalf. Paul says, I'll pay for it. Look at what he says. He says, he says in verse number 19, I, Paul, am writing with my own hand. Paul is saying, now I'm telling you, I'm putting this in ink on my own. I'm doing it on my own volition. I'm doing it with my own hands. And I'm not only that, I am doing it with the intentions of you knowing I did it so that you can set him free and hold me accountable for it. I, Paul, verse 19, I, Paul, am writing with my own hand. I will repay. Paul says, I'm writing with my own hand. And see, there was a time, and, and people in the 21st century may not know this, but there was a time when men would make promises and they would keep their promise. Mm -hmm. There were times when my granddaddy and my daddy would actually shake another man's hand and they would keep their promises. Nowadays, you can shake a hand, you can shake a head, you can put it in writing, and they will never come through. People will write it now with their own hands and still won't come through. Paul is saying, I'm writing this with my own hands. And as I write it with my own hands, I want you to know that I'm going to come through. 
says, he says, I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay. You see, first of all, Philemon could depend on Paul. Paul's character was of such where he had proven himself. Paul had integrity. My question to you today, can anybody depend on you to do what you've said? Can anybody depend on you to say, to say, put it on my account and you still do it? Because there are some people who will say, put it on my account and they will ignore the whole account. There are some people you can get a lawyer and they will ignore the lawyer. There are some people you can take to court and they will ignore the judge. Paul says, if he's done anything wrong, put it on my account. I, Paul, am writing this in my own hand. I will repay. Is your reputation of one? Is your re reputation is of such that people know that you will do what you said you would do? Paul is not just making these promises on his account. He's making this promise on Onesimus' account. Can somebody make a promise on your account and you come through? <laughs> And they come through. He says, I will repay. Not to mention to you that you owe me even your own self besides. Paul reminds him. In the 21st century, we'll say that Paul is throwing slugs here. <laughs> In the 21st century, we'll say that Paul is jabbing right here. In the 21st century, we'll say that Paul is reminding him that you already owe me. Paul says, let me mention to you. He says not to mention, but what he's saying is, let me mention this one thing to you. That you owe me even your own life. Paul reminds him that I'm responsible for your new birth experience. Can you remember who's responsible for your new birth experience? Can you remember who taught you the word of God? Can you remember who told you the story of the death, burial, and resurrection? You re received Jesus Christ as your personal savior. Can you remember? Can you remember that one time that someone led you to Christ? Can you really remember? When you gave God your heart, Paul is telling Philemon, brother, don't get beside yourself. Mm -hmm. He says, brother, just because you are saved, just because you're going to heaven, just because you're walking with God, don't get stuck on yourself. Yeah. He said, because I don't want to even have to start remembering mm -hmm. or mentioning what you owe me. Paul takes credit for his very own life, for, for Philemon's very own life. Paul takes credit. Let me just say to you, all the people who you led to Christ, God gives you credit. Yeah. You ought to be getting busy. You ought to be saving souls. You ought to be introducing people to Jesus Christ because God is putting it on your account. You ought to get busy about saving souls for Christ. And I know we don't save souls, but God put us in the midst of people so we can present him before people. God wants you to be the one to reach out to others. Mm -hmm. Paul reminds Philemon, you owe me. So it wasn't uncommon, just as it's not uncommon today to call in your favors, to, to, to remind people you owe me one, to remind people that, that there's a favor that's hanging out there that you still owe me for. Paul says, not to mention, you owe me your very self. Paul says, you, you, you not only do you owe me you, you owe me a debt. You owe me a spiritual debt. 
and I'm calling in this spiritual debt now. Let me just make sure we understand. You don't owe any man for saving you other than Jesus Christ. He says, make sure you receive Onesimus. Make sure you receive Onesimus and forgive him. Welcome him back home because he's useful to you. And don't let me start mentioning what I've done for you. So Paul says, don't let me mention the spiritual things I've done. And don't let me mention the physical things that I've done. Because people who run together ought to do things for each other. People who, who, who serve in ministry together, ministry ought not be one-sided. You ought to contribute to ministry. Amen. That's, why, that's why I tell people, don't leave it up to the pastor to reach everybody. Everybody has to put a hook in the sea. Amen. Everybody has to put a bait on their hook. Oftentimes tell a three four story. And one is if I called you over my house and we going fishing, if we're going fishing, you already have in your mind what we're gonna do. I call you over to my house, it's pouring down raining outside, but we going fishing. There's water puddling outside. So I call you over to my house, we go out there on the driveway. And we throw our hooks and our bait into the water in the street. You're going to think I've lost it. Matter of fact, you're going to know I lost it. Because fish don't come to you. You go to fish. But that's the problem in the local church. We think the fish are going to come up the driveway. But we have to make sure we go get the fish. That's what, it's all, that's what it's all about. It's not only the fact that fish comes on a regular basis. You got to get new fish. The only fish coming up the driveway are fish that are already attending. We have to leave the house. We have to leave the church. We have to leave our places of worship and go catch fish. Fish just don't show up on the driveway. Fish just don't leave the road and, and come up in, into the house. You got to go get fish. My second part of this, this, this trilogy of truth is that I ask you to come over to my house. We're going fishing. And I take you in my living room and I got this huge fish bowl there with all kinds of pretty fish. And I take my hook and my bait and put it over in the fishbowl. And then you put yours over in the fishbowl. Now we both look like food. The problem here is these fish are already caught. If the fish are already caught, we don't have to catch the fish. The problem is many people sit around the church and they excite each other. They amaze each other. They talk to each other. They witness to each other. But those fish are already caught. They're already in the church. You got to leave the church and go catch the fish. That's why Jesus says go. In, in the process of your going, go and catch fish. Yes. Jesus says, I will make you fishermen of men. My third part of this trilogy of truth is that I leave home, you ride with me, and I take the whole congregation down to the Galveston Bay. I take my pole and my fish and I, I, I my pole and my hook and, and cast the line into the bay. And I'm the only person with a hook in the water. Let me just say to you today, the church begins to be sanctified cheerleaders. Standing behind the pastor saying, catch those fish, catch those fish, catch those fish, pastor, catch those fish. Let me tell you, we don't need sanctified cheerleaders. We need everybody to put a hook with a bait on it in the water. Some fish don't even like your, your pastor. 
Some fish won't even hear your pastor. Some fish won't even come near your pastor. Some fish think your pastor's bait is not the right bait. Yes. But if all of us catch a pole, catch a bait, and put it into the water, we can catch some fish. Mm -hmm. I'm saying to you, the only thing I'm saying to you today is we ought to be catching men, women, boys, and girls for the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. Don't leave it to anybody else. You ought to catch some fish. You ought not be sanctified cheerleaders. You ought to be catching fish. Paul says, Paul says to him, Philemon, you owe me. I was responsible for catching you for the kingdom. In other words, I am partly responsible for you dying and going to heaven. I am partly responsible because you were on your way to hell. Philemon, let me remind you, you ain't all that. Let me just remind you, Philemon, it's not because you have arrived. It's because God used me one day. And as God used me, I'm asking you to allow God to use you. You see, the problem with the local church is that we've gotten so holy, so spiritually minded, that earth has left us. Mm -hmm. When we get to a point where we understand that the church has left the building, mm -hmm. then we realize that the church is in us. We just show up at the building to encourage each other. Mm -hmm. But the church has to keep moving. That's why, that's why all over the world, all over the world, People have not been able to go into synagogues. They have not been able to go into churches. They have not been able to go into mosques. But all over the world, preachers are still preaching. Yes, teachers are still teaching. All over the, the world, singers are still singing. Mm -hmm. Praise dancers are still praise dancing. Choirs are start, still lifting their voices all over the world because we cannot stop ministering for Jesus Christ. Yes. Finally, verse number 20. Yes, brother. Let me have joy from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Lord. Paul talks about this in verse number 7. And he tells Philemon, you are a refreshment to the kingdom of God. He reminds Philemon that God has put something in you that has caused you to be the blessing to other people. Now he comes back and says, Philemon, I ask you for the sake of Onesimus, for the sake of your spiritual walk in Jesus Christ, refresh once again. He says, he says, refresh my heart in the Lord. He's already told him in verse number seven that you've been a great refreshment. He's already told him that, that you need to know that I respect you so much because you've been such a refreshment in the kingdom of God. He says here, now, be a refreshment to me and the Lord. Be a refreshment to my heart. Be, be, be there to, to excite me again in the Lord. He says, he says to him, he says, says to him, whatever you do, receive this, my brother. Mm -hmm. He says, hold it to my account because I will repay you. Not to mention that I've been responsible for you coming to Christ. Mm -hmm. I've been responsible for being a blessing in your life. He says, if he's wronged you, if he's done anything that he owes you for, put it on my account. And then he says, you are my partner. Receive him as you have received me, or as you would receive me. The thing that stands out in this whole pericope is, Paul says, put it on my account. Paul says, if he owes you anything, if he's done any wrong, put it on my account. I need to close here by telling you, Jesus over 2,000 years ago, Amen. said to God, 
I know this messed up world has been a messed up world for a long time. Mm -hmm. Jesus, right. over 2,000 years ago, said, Lord, I know they've been wrong. He didn't ask if they've been wrong. He said, Lord, I know they've been wrong. That's right. That's right. But God, whatever you do, put it on my account. Mm -hmm. Jesus, <laughs> Jesus said to mankind, don't worry about it. I'm going to make a way for you out of no way. And he looks to God and said, God, my father. God, the, the, the first person of the triune. God, the first person of the trinity. God, I know they messed up. God, I know they've fallen short. God, I know they're guilty as charged. But whatever you do, God. Put it on my account. Okay. And he goes on to say, not only should you put it on my account, but I promise I'll repay. Yes. And that's what Jesus did. Mm -hmm. Over 2,000 years ago, he put our sin, our indebtment, he put it on his account. He took a tree. He took, he took a stick. He took a twig. He took a cross. And died on that tree. Yes. Died on that cross. Died on that stick. Died on that tree. He did it for you and for me. <laughs> sin. Our sins, not his sin, was put on Jesus' account. Mm -hmm. He died for you and for me. Mean men killed him. They took him off the cross. They took Jesus off the cross and laid him in a borrowed tomb. It was a borrowed tomb because it didn't need it too long because early that third day morning, Jesus rose with all power in heaven and earth in his hand. He put heaven and earth on his shoulder. He rose for you and me. And that same Jesus is available to you tonight. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. You can come to Jesus just as you are. You can get to know him tonight. Jesus has said to God, God, whoever they are, whatever they've done, however they have done it, put it on my account. Put it on my account. I will pay it. I will repay. And that's what he did. Over 2,000 years ago, Jesus, the Son of God, died for you and for me. He took it. He took our sins. And he voluntarily put it on his account. He died for us because we weren't fit to die. Yes. Too mean to live. Jesus paid the price in his death, burial, and resurrection. He didn't stay dead. He rose early that third day morning for you and for me. He got up early that third day morning. And if you're listening to me tonight, he got up for you. He got up for me. And you can trust him. He will be there for you. If you never received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, this is your moment. This is your opportunity to get to know him. The door is open. The invitation is extended. Wouldn't you like to go to heaven when you die? Wouldn't you like Jesus to be your Lord and your Savior? Would you receive him tonight? You can receive him by just repeating after me. And asking Jesus to come into your heart. Believing the story that Jesus died, Jesus was buried, Jesus rose, and he was seen. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 5, this is the gospel. And if you can believe the gospel, you can be saved right here, right now. Just trust Jesus. Will you bow your head with me and repeat after me and invite Jesus into your life? 
Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you were buried in a borrowed tomb. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God. We believe if you prayed this prayer and honestly believe the story to get you to heaven, we believe that you're born again. We believe that now if you die, when you die, you will go to heaven when you die. There may be others of you who have lacked commitment. You've not been committed to Jesus Christ. This is your moment. This is your opportunity to find new commitment in him. This is your opportunity to rededicate this is your opportunity to recommit, your opportunity to, to rejoin this walk in Christ. If you're saved, you will always be saved. You're still saved. If you've ever received Christ as your Savior, you did not stop being saved. So you have a relationship with him. But if you're not following him, you've fallen out of fellowship. You're still God's child but you've just been his bad child. I submit to you today, if you would join me in prayer, I want to pray for you that Jesus Christ will be your Lord as well as your Savior. Because as you commit to him, he's not only your Savior, he becomes your Lord. Father God, we thank you for those who have not been committed. We thank you for those who have not com been committed to God, have not been committed to the word of God, who have not been committed to the church of God, who have not been committed to saturating themselves with the word and trusting you. Lord, somebody's struggling tonight. They're struggling with a crisis of belief. Lord, help their unbelief. Bless them to believe once again that you are God and you're God alone. Lord, we ask you to touch. We ask you to heal. We ask you to bless. We ask you to strengthen and bless them to think about the goodness of God. So much so till they glorify you, till they bless your name, till they even shout unto you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Song says it makes you want to shout. When I think about the goodness of the Lord, how He saved me, how He raised me, how He filled me, to the earth. When I think about Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Makes me want to shout. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, you're worthy of all the honor. It's now offering time, and it's time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. It's time to give unto the Lord. It's time to give unto the Lord. It's time to give unto the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. There are many of you who have been given, who have been giving uh, by way of zeal. We want you to continue to give by way of zeal. There are some of you who have been given by way of P.O. Box. We want you to continue to give by mailing to the P.O. Box 
Some of you are still giving by way of Cash App. We are transitioning away from Cash App uh, to Zelle, electronically to Zelle. We want to make sure that all of your stuff is accounted for. Amen. Uh, if you only have Cash App, go ahead and give tonight to Cash App. But we want you to, to slowly move to Zelle or to P.O. Box. Or you can go to your bank and, and tell your bank that you want to, to put forth a check every two weeks or every week to the P.O. Box. The P.O. Box is New Beginning Church, P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas. P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting, the idea here is as we lift Jesus, he draw all men unto himself. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. And finally, our cash app is cash tag NBC Souls, dollar sign NBC Souls, cash tag NBC Souls. I want to thank all of you who have joined us tonight. Thank you for joining us for our Bible study. Our Bible study is here every Wednesday night at 7 uh, 20 p.m., 7 20 p.m. And please join us on Sunday morning at 9 a.m., 9 a.m. for Sunday school. Uh, and also on Sunday morning for Sunday worship at 10.45 a.m. I also want to ask you to go ahead and join and link up with the New Beginning Church uh, Facebook page. New Beginning Church. Uh, go ahead and uh, like or connect or subscribe to the New Beginning Church Facebook page. And uh, also push the notification button so whenever we have something going on, you would know about it right away. You don't like to hear gossip, do you? <laughs> you would know about it firsthand. So hit that notification button so you can be a part of the New Beginning Church. Thank you again for joining us here tonight. Thank you for being a part of our service. We're praying for Gilbert Garza. We're lifting Gilbert Garza in prayer. As he go into surgery on tomorrow, we're praying for Gilbert Garza. Also, next Sunday, this coming Sunday, this coming Sunday, uh, it's first Sunday, and so we will be having communion, virtual communion. Those who will be at church during that time, we will have in-person communion. Um, of course, you've seen that Sister Davis and I are back in the building. Uh, anyone who wants to show up uh, can show up. If you feel comfortable, please feel free to show up. We are socially distancing or spiritually distancing. So please come by if you feel comfortable enough to come on, come on in the house, come on in the house. There's no guilt. There is absolutely no guilt. There's no shame for you to come back anytime soon. But if you feel comfortable, please come. We have some measures in place. We'll be taking your temperature. We will have, you will have to wear masks the whole time you're in the room. You, you, uh, you will also, we will be tracking or, or tracing uh, based on who shows up. So at the door, you would have to give your name, your phone number, and you will be your, your temperature will, will, will be recorded. So please, ma'am, please, sir, just be mindful that we are tracking or tracing to make sure that if there's anything that, that shows up after church is over, you'll be able to be notified to, uh, to secure yourself, <laughs> seclude yourself, to quarantine yourself, isolate yourself. So we want you to know that we're serving communion both at the church as well as virtually on Sunday. Also, uh, vaccines are out. Vaccines are out. And uh, if you're not on the list, if you feel comfortable, please uh, get your vaccine. Uh, don't wait. If it's your time, go do it now. If it's not your time, when your time come up, go ahead and get your vaccine. Um, uh, I'm not a, a proponent of not taking it. I'm a proponent of taking it. We want to get back to normal. Also, April 4th is Resurrection Sunday. Resurrection Sunday, we will have we will have a parking lot service. Resurrection Sunday, we'll be having a parking lot service at 1045 
a.m. Resurrection Sunday, April the 4th, we'll be having a Resurrection Sunday parking lot service. We'll be having parking lot service Resurrection Sunday. Last year, this time, we had Resurrection Sunday parking lot service. So we'll be having parking lot service April 4th of this year. And we pray that uh, that the coronavirus going back to hell where it came from and uh, that we, uh, we get back to some sense of normalcy. Thank you so much for joining us. We at the New Beginning Church, we are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, "In I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for all that you do. Lord, we ask you to bless us now. Keep us now. Bless us, Father God, that we will always be about your business. Bless us to be able to forgive. Bless us to be able to walk with those in Christ. Bless us to, to love you, Father God, and to love mankind. And Lord, we ask you to keep the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Hallelujah, Lord, you're worthy.